It's hot in here. Yeah. It's really hot in here. <laughs> I had to turn off three fans? Two. Nope. Actually, I left one of them on. It's still on. You think it's picking up? Do I have to get up and turn off this fan, or can we just keep going? I, I, don't, I don't hear it, but I can't. I couldn't tell you because the voice, the, the call software will filter out your fan noise. I've zoomed as far into the waveform and audacity I as I possibly I turn it off. can. It's so hot in here, though. I'm going to make you fix the audio file if it's, it's fucked up. It's 80 degrees in this house. Okay, well, you have to keep talking while I go turn off this fan. Okay, I mean, look, the nice thing about living a mile from the beach is that even though the uh, humidity is very, very high all the time, sometimes the fog comes and it was like 55 degrees and really foggy last night. Yeah. Um, so I opened up the windows because the fog pulls all the particulate out of the air. Oh, man. Great. I didn't think about that. Yeah. That's yeah, you, pr pretty like, handy right now. Yeah, it's the best. It's like it's like a it's like a air filter for the for the world, basically. Uh, it does, the bad news is it distributes the parking particulate evenly over fucking everything. Walls, cars, the ground, windows, like there's little dots of soot everywhere when you go outside right now, I'm sure. But but 60 degrees. I had a pretty profound the world is F moment this week when I we had all the windows open because of the heat wave. Yeah. And yeah. at some point I looked around the house and realized yeah. that there was a layer of ash accumulating on everything. <laughs> and I've been slowly cleaning that up for the last two days. So we did backyard camping because my daughter likes to, to camp. We usually go camping right before school starts. School started this week and we weren't able to do it this year because of the Rona. So we did a backyard camp set up and we were out there Saturday night and the lightning started at about three o'clock in the morning. And I was like, well, we are going in. I'm not going to be in the backyard when the lightning starts. And about the time we got in, the wind gusted up to 60 or 70 miles an hour. And the, the tent did one of those <laughs> things, which like impressively stayed up. Well, I was like, OK, we can go out and have a real storm in this tent. This is good. like going to REI was a good move. It turns good, out. Yeah, good road test for your tent. Yeah. Um, she wasn't impressed with that. And she did not like the lightning because it's maybe the second time she's seen lightning in her seven and a People half year out life. here really don't like lightning. It turns out I, mean, I found like my I mean, you and I both grew up with it. You know, like in the South, like I don't people, I don't know if people don't know this that haven't lived in the South, but like there are stretches of the summer where you have a thunderstorm, like literally every afternoon, <laughs> every afternoon. Yeah, it's, it's like like clockwork. And then out here, like we had lightning for, you know, you have lightning maybe every three or four years or something. And it, people are it, terrified it, by it. I mean, look, when you're among the primitives, Brad, <laughs> then you have to know that they're going to have different uh, feelings about the sky opening. Uh, are you saying it, we're going to have to bring these people civilization? I, I mean, we're going to have to explain what weather is to them is the problem. But anyway, um, yeah, it's been it's been a week, man. I, I apologize because I know some people uh, turn to things like podcasts uh, for kind of an uplifting escape from the world rather than to be reminded about everything that's going wrong. But I saw a tweet last night that just summed it up so succinctly. OK, it was essentially I'm paraphrasing here, but it was basically like we're trapped inside because of a pandemic. We're baking in our houses because of a heat wave. Yeah. Check. Uh, we don't have air. We, we don't have air conditioning because there's no market incentive to provide it to people. And mm -hmm. we can't open the windows because the air is poison outside. Yep. We're kind of getting it from every angle right now. So I've got one more um, because the fires south of San Francisco down the peninsula between San Francisco and Santa Cruz, uh, between Half Moon Bay and Santa Cruz are, you know, close enough that we've started thinking about what happens if we have to leave yeah <laughs> should we just start the show oh we're getting there <laughs> Welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad. Welcome to a cheery episode. Hey, Brad. Hi. Uh, look, in fire season, we do uplifting episodes of the show, apparently. <laughs> we should we should chat. When did we do our disaster episode last year? Was it around this time? It was like time? the sixth episode. So it was, it was a, maybe it was later. Fire season started later last year because school was already going. It's like clockwork. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, shocking. Um, but yeah, like I saw uh, it was funny. Jane McGonigal tweeted last night uh, that. Like she was like, I don't know if I can do this every year in San Francisco. This is traumatized. Like even even if you're on a like I have I have a friend 
I have a friend who lives in Sonoma now whose farm, whose house burned to the ground in the Santa Rosa fires three or four years ago. And they had to evacuate two days ago. And and oh, my like, God, I can't even like it's bad enough for the second like, time. It's bad enough for people like us who are basically just dealing with bad air quality and heat. For yeah. Of course, I mean, you've got pressing concerns as the fire moves northward, obviously. But like, yeah, to 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 actually lose your house and then go through another evacuation after that, like I would I, be out of here. I, I can't even imagine. Um, But I mean, that's the thing is, I think I think we're getting to the point that, like, if everybody's working at home. And uh, we're going to be trapped inside the house for at least another nine months because of Rona and maybe more than that. Why am I paying a buttload of money to live in a 1000 square foot house in the Bay Area when I can't do any of the nice outside Bay Area things? And like we deal with fires and horrible air for two months every every fall and rolling power outages and. Like what the California dream, man, it's not, (laughs) it's not what it used to be. (laughs) It's not the sixties anymore. That's for sure. No. Now I just am looking forward to having like reliable electricity and, uh, well, so one of the things that's been fun about, I say fun, I air quote fun about this whole 2020 experience is learning that like the gap between me and crazy prepper people, maybe less far than I thought. It's narrowing year by year. Yeah. I mean, that was that episode last year, right? It was like proto prepping. Yeah, really? Uh, well, it's, it's one of those things. It's one of those things that like, I don't like, I was looking at solar stuff the other day. So I was like, you know, it'd be nice if we had solar, if, if the power goes out again, if we had solar, so we could at least get a few hours of like electricity a day and have a battery wall and all that stuff so that we can, so we can just disconnect from the grid when the power goes out and then reconnect when it comes back on. Sure. And it's not like it's it's expensive, but it's not when you amortize it out over the over 20 years. It's it's a pretty reasonable purchase. Right. It's like you're not you're not doing anything crazy. Also, it's not it it, it ceases being a purely economic concern when you add like the a matter of survival into the equation. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah, like people talk about, should I get solar? against the cost of just staying on the grid you know what i mean like it's like yeah. am, I, am i actually how long is it you know how many years is it going to take to save money off of this it's going to be 12 years before this is paid for and i actually start saving money and nobody wants to do that but when you factor in <laughs> when you factor in a situation like this that is now occurring on a basically annual basis suddenly well, like it's it's more of an investment in you and your family's like sanity and survival than it is like purely a fiscal thing well and if like yeah, it, it makes it, it it's funny the through the light of what to do in case of disaster, you, your decisions about like if you want to remodel the house, if I had to re, if I was remodeling the house now, I think I would probably, you know, build a fucking brutalist concrete nightmare <laughs> that's impervious to fire. Also, maybe, right? a, maybe a moat. Yeah, yeah it's a, a moat seems like a good idea, Brad. I don't know, man. I. uh so so yeah, like the TLDR is that we're not in the anywhere in, we're not in any danger of evacuation right now. Um, but you personally, like you mean your family? Where you? My are. family personally, yeah. but we are fifteen miles from the evacuation zone. Yeah, I know, and, I know. I know people up north who are basically also in the same situation as you. Of we're not we're not being told to leave yet, but it's getting worse, and it might happen in another day or two. Like it's it's it, it feels like it's happening on all sides this year there, like like, a, it, like every year it's somewhere yeah. like like a couple of years ago it was the north bay sometimes it's the east bay but this year it is the north bay the east bay the south bay it is everywhere well it's because of that lightning storm actually yeah. oh yeah yeah i know so yeah the lightning t- t- we we don't normally have thunderstorms this time of year and like this is another one of those unpredicted uh uh side effects of of climate change right so um so we Tri- thought Last year, we did the disaster preparedness kit. I thought maybe this year we thought we should do like what to take if you have to evacuate, because there yeah, are I, a lot of natural disasters you have to evacuate for. Floods I feel like, I feel and like we, should, and- we should mention real quick <laughs> up to about 45 minutes ago, we were planning on doing something with like the history of video game controllers, <laughs> sort of well, digging, digging into the mechanisms and mechanics of uh it turns just out there's buttons spitballing it's about simple. Yeah. But, but it was just, ah, it was, it's hard to think about that right now. There's a lot more pressing concerns uh, on our minds. Yeah. So we pivoted to this. It's something uplifting. Yeah. Um, but before, uh, before, before we get into that, 
Can mm-hmm. I ask a, a streaming question for you? Because you've been sure. doing this and it's been hot there. Sure. How hot does it get in your room oh when you God. shut the door and you're playing games that, and you're streaming a video game? <laughs> that's what I wanted to talk about first. Too. <laughs> have, have you ever heard the metaphor about boiling a frog? Yes. I you put them in the pot and they don't realize that it's hot until like yeah. they're cooked. I yeah, can, yeah, so I, I can absolutely attest that is a thing that you've boiled frogs. Oh, let's not talk about our extracurricular activities here, please. That's, I thought we promised. I thought we promised to save that. I thought that was going to be an us thing. Um, it's kind of sign up for our OnlyFans. No, like seriously, there it happens kind of regularly for me. Like you stream for two, three hours and you just get into you yep. kind of lock in, you know, you're just like focusing on what you're doing and like trying to be entertaining or like, you know, checking your stream quality. There's a lot of stuff to distract you, right? And it's yeah. only it's only at the moment you click stop that you realize I'm glued to this chair. <laughs> like well, I am I am just a, a disgusting, grimy mess. It feels like a sauna in here. And that happens quite a bit. So like, yeah, since we're in the situation where like we don't have air conditioning, like, I mean, I don't know about you guys. We don't even have ceiling fans in this house. Like we've only got what we ceiling. Uh, yeah, see, but we have uh, central we have cent- a central furnace, so we can turn on like the whole house fan. Okay, that helps to circulate air through the house, but the exhaust, it doesn't help that much. Yeah, um, but yeah, like there's, not, yeah, there's just there's just no good air flow. Like, the irony is, it's like very pleasant outside right now. Actually, it's like nice and cool and breezy. If we could open the windows, this would totally not be a problem, but we can't. But you have windows on both sides, right? Yes. One of the this one in the office that I'm in faces the kind of fire escape stairwell like enclosure yeah, yeah. there's there's not a ton of airflow out there but there's enough i, I, I ha- we, we do get like a good cross breeze if we open all the windows i was gonna say do you have one of those fans that you like mount in the windows and blocks all the gaps and then oh like, like a can, proper exhaust fan like a proper exhaust no. fan that'll pull air through i hadn't thought about that so we have one of those and that that thing does works wonders i bet um if you like open one window and then open the window that that's on and set that thing to suck it'll pull <laughs> it'll pull a it'll pull a pretty good cool stream through yeah, the that, house that, yeah we're um, we're so close to the water that we get a good ocean breeze most of the time so there's yeah. some some airflow anyway but uh i i've been wondering about that from just like a a basic thermodynamic standpoint like enclosed space you know like certain volume of air to fill and then i'm looking at like okay i've got a windows machine here there's a nasa yeah. in the corner okay now i'm playing a game so like the gpu is probably pumping out more heat than usual <laughs> you know what yeah. i mean like like we you and i both have plasma tvs and those put out a lot more heat than more modern stuff like i'm, I'm basically looking around like itemizing my tech life in here and trying to figure out how much heat each one of these things is putting out how many watts each one produces right. yeah it's like it's, 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 it's not an insubstantial amount right like that is absolutely contributing to the heat in here right yeah so so i have when I stream at night, I have to shut the door because I have a sleeping child like 10 feet from me. Um, so it's the gaming PC, the streaming PC, like neither the gaming PC runs at full speed because I often like run with VSync off and will run as fast as it'll run. But like the streaming PC is usually a pretty low load. It's like 10, 15 percent CPU because it's a hexacore with a decent GPU. So so like those those are both ticking over a little bit, but it's not, you know, it's not it still generates a shitload of heat. So when I leave the room, it's often 90 or 95 in here. Oh my God. And, and I go out and it's like, we have air conditioning. Cause I step out of the door and I'm like, right. Oh God. All the sweat just, just dr- instantly dries off of me. Cause the temperature change, the differential is so nice. Uh, condense that, yeah. It. Yeah. 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 But, but like, I, so there's, a, there's some solutions. Like, unfortunately we don't have a good place to dangle a window air conditioner. Cause like the window for my office would block, if I put one out the window there, it would block the entrance to the house, which I mean, I guess right now probably doesn't make that <laughs> much of a difference. Not that big a deal. Um, Wouldn't that be that would probably be too loud to stream with, though, right? You know, it's funny. I can run with the with one of those window fans in behind the green screen and it doesn't come across hmm. with the mic with the because I use the I use the close up boom mic rather than like the big podcast mic that I'm using right now for streaming stuff. I just had to check to make sure I was using the big podcast mic. Um, but but yeah, it's uh, it's not great. Like that that ends my streams. Like the temperature when it gets too hot in here, that usually ends the streams because you like you don't realize that it's getting hot until like it's eighty five and somebody comes in and is like, hey, I think the white balance on your camera is wrong, <laughs> and it's just that you didn't refill your drink recently enough, so you haven't been drinking water for the last hour, and your face is starting to get red. Ugh. It's not great. <laughs> 
Uh, so do you think uh, how, not, not to how, make those? How'd, how'd you get heat stroke? Will? oh, <laughs> uh, you know, I was, I was, I was really into flight sim and <laughs> that thing really hits the GPU. So it got hot in here fast as hell. You were just yeah, flicking not, off those sick headshots so fast that you look, man, I can overheat. I, I, yeah. Um, yeah, not, not but, to make the whole episode about this, we can move on. But like, do you think, do you think the, do you think the sum total of all the, these types of common devices, computing devices would equal like what, a like a small space heater or something? Like what's the, I, I, what do you think the I heat have, output is? I, well, I mean, it's easy. You know what the heat, heat intake is and you know that most of it is converted to energy. So is that, is that the conversion actually? I was going to say like, cause I, you, you know what the input is, but I don't know how much comes out as heat versus, but is it, is it, it, is it just about all of it? I think all of it comes out as heat, right? Because okay. it's like like you're even even when you successfully do a computation, that turns into heat. Oh, I guess I guess you're right because like it's not like it's being uh, funneled into like a, a mechanical action or something, right? There's nowhere no. else for it to go or nothing. I mean, nothing no other hard drives. Sure. Well, I mean, there's nothing else for it to manifest as in terms of other types of energy, right? Like no. So so the thing the thing I thought about doing I thought about building a closed loop water cooler with a radiator on the top. Because I have a crawl space under my under my office uh-huh. and it, the crawl space vents outside and there's a little fan under there to blow air through. So it doesn't get so it doesn't get damp under there if it rains. OK. And I was thinking about drilling a hole in the floor, oh my God. two holes. Oh, my God. And putting some quick release cables with a radiator under there. Wow. And then having like basically I'd have to have two radiators. Right. So I'd have to have one radiator that's up here for when I need to move the PC and not be near the the basement. And then the other one would vent heat into the crawl space. Oh, that's incredible. I bet it's pretty cool under there. It is. It's always like 60 degrees, 65 degrees, Man, 75 that's a, degrees. Oh, that's amazing. But like, I I also know that if we add, if I make it warm under there, it's going to amount, it's going to increase the amount of water that can hold under that area Ooh. in the air. <laughs> a lot of and I don't want to like create condensation problems in my crawl space because that seems like it would be real bad. So I've kind of held off. Sure. Are there um, what did you call them? Quick release? Like, are there connectors yeah, quick- that are there connectors that are like leak proof enough that you would trust something you can connect and disconnect on a regular basis? Let's say yes. <laughs> Theoretically, I have not used them, but I have been told there. There, I know that there are quick release cables for specifically this purpose. Not like not for being a dumbass and piping your heat into the basement, but like there are quick release cables for this kind of piping that are. Okay. That oh are yeah. Reliable. I mean, I, I guess even outside the world of PC water cooling, just to like in, in the actual plumbing, there must be some kind of yeah. gear that, that serves that purpose. Right. Well, and they, and they have to be real, like they, the connections have to be fast and not bubbly. Cause you don't want to add a bunch of air to your water cooling loop. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Leaks, um, leaks are always the thing that have scared me off of water cooling. I mean, I've dabbled with it. I, I had a water cooling setup back at like 20 ish years ago. Wow, really? About that was two, early. Two, two, yeah, like, dude, I was using a literal like small aquarium pump. Car, yeah, like a, an actual an actual aquarium pump, and like I, I the radiator was about I don't know, Ten, like twelve by twelve centimeters, probably something yeah. like that. Like, where would that have come from? That's not a car radiator. That's a no. They you could buy PC radiators back then, but it, it was didn't, they it would did have not, been, It did not look like it was made for a PC like purpose. I'm not sure it, where I got it from. It could have been for like a fridge or a small compressor. That, small maybe it was something like that. Something but that like was that. absolutely before there were all in one water cooling solutions and you had to yeah. just roll your own. And I was on some forum <laughs> just like it was a bad idea. Like I feel I feel like the first time we did water cooling at maximum PC was in like 2002 or 2003. It was around that time. It being a real novelty. But then yes. like, like there was no there was one company that made parts basically at that point. And it was some some guys in Oregon, maybe. Right. Who I think were like air conditioner guys. I don't know. Right. Like I was you you literally had to source all the parts from from aquarium supply. Like you said, you know, like plumbing stuff. Yeah. Like I went to the hardware store like you were literally ginning it all up yourself. Except for, the you know, the water block obviously was made for that purpose. But that was like some boutique shop with machine tools, like machining it themselves or whatever. Well, it was like very uh, DIY. Yeah. Like those early blocks were just a big old slab of, of copper yeah, or whatever, was. whatever material with like f- water channels cut in the top. Yep. And then they bolted a piece of plexiglass on top yep. with a couple of pipe fittings on it. Uh, yep. Uh, to be clear, it worked like I never had a leak or, you know, it never ruined any equipment. Yeah. Like It did what it was supposed to do. But like I got algae buildup in the pipes because nobody was talking about additives to prevent that sort of thing back then. Like it and, and I had to cut a hole in my shitty old case to like run the. the, the oh, right. Pipe, there were no hose holes piping out. Yeah, because there was no accommodation for that stuff. So it yeah. was like a Frankenstein's monstrosity. Like it just wasn't worth the hassle. It was it was novel. The, uh, the one I only did one custom loop 
and then switched all in ones because they're so much easier. Uh, but the custom loop I did was for uh, a I can't remember. It was it was like a pre quad core, probably one of the Pentiums with two CPUs on the distinct CPUs on the die, um, like or late Pentium fours probably. And and when I moved, it had an external radiator. I was so afraid when I moved that I would bump the cable and knock one of the fittings loose that I was like, I'm just going to drain the whole fucking thing. <laughs> And then I'll refill it when I get there. And yeah, and it, it, it was it was a huge pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I don't know if the hassle is worth it these days. Also, the biggest reason I would get water cooling is for the, the noise factor, because I just I just want my machine to be as quiet as possible. But a lot of people say that a good air cooler is actually quieter these days. Well, I think on the CPU side, that's absolutely the case. There's some there's some uh, really, really quiet air coolers these days for CPUs. The problem is the GPUs when you when yeah. you hit your GPU hard, like when I run flight sim or PUBG or literally anything that hits the GPU, it sounds like a jet turbine. And um, it's like, so here's the other, here's the other ridiculous idea I had for cooling the PC without cooling, warming up the room. What if I just get a five gallon bucket of water and put a, put a heat exchanger in there with the mm. water loop through that. Okay. And then at the end of the night, I just, <laughs> just dump the, the bucket water. of water in the tub. <laughs> Not the worst idea. And, uh, and get a fresh one for the next day. So, it, so, you know, cause the water will hold more heat than the air in the room. So anyway. Yeah. Uh, have, have GPUs gotten worse about that stuff? Like I've got a regular GTX 1080, not a non TI version and it doesn't get that loud. And I just, I didn't, you know, I, 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 so, wonder, I wonder if they've gotten a lot noisier. Um, it depends on the GPU. I know that there are some third party coolers for the 2080s that are quieter than the founders edition, which is what I have. Um, the, you can tweak the fan profiles. Like one of the things I do to, to make the noise less annoying is instead of having it like, I, I, I don't, I don't like by default, the fan curve on the, on the 2080 TI founders will spin up and spin down pretty dramatically, which is the thing that annoys me yeah. more than anything else. Yeah. Um, if you, if you set that to like bump up once it crosses certain thresholds and not come back down and, and set the can't remember there's a term that means it, it it basically averages out over a longer period of time to decide if it's going to spin up or down that that helps a ton uh there's also some like like i was looking at this nz the nzxt i'd be curious if anybody's used one of these but nzxt has this thing that basically is like a frame with a fan that goes on and then holds an, a cpu all in one cooling block on the huh. gpu interesting and it's like 20 bucks and wow. I have a couple of spare all in ones that I'm not I, I have a spare all in one that I'm not using that's compatible with it. Huh. And I've kind of thought about grabbing that. But we're so close to the 3080s that yeah. I'm just like, I don't know if I want to invest any time or energy in making this work. Might as well wait and see. Have you seen that there are uh, there are three slot cooling solutions now for, oh, for I, GPUs? My, 20, my 1080 <laughs> Ti is a three slot. Really? It, it's, it's not. It is a like 2.5 slot. But okay. it, you can't put anything in the in the adjoining slots. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So that that's it's, the other that's the other reason I wouldn't get water is that, uh, you know, there you get an all in one system that's just for CPU. You can probably be pretty sure that it's leak tested and like enclosed properly and all that stuff. But there aren't really all in ones that also incorporate a GPU. Right. And I would absolutely want that, meaning I would have to open it up and do a custom loop. And at that point, like I'm subject to my own errors uh, and have to worry constantly about leaks. And it's just the whole yep. thing just doesn't seem worth it. I I'm. <clears throat> Late in a in a GPU generation, it definitely does not seem worth it. Early in a GPU generation, yes, eh, yes. maybe 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 things will look very different in a couple weeks. Yeah. Um. Okay, so let's all get right. to the topic but, at yes, hand. Yes, that's that's all enough about that's that. A, the longest cold open we've ever done. I think. Wow. Um. So you have to leave your house. Yeah. Are we talking short notice? I mean. I, I, guess they're all, I guess they're all short notice, right? I guess nobody really thinks they're going to nobody plans long term for an evacuation, right? If you have like, to evacuate, yeah, the, you have to do it soon. You, you have at most, I would think, a few days, okay, right? Sure. So like presumably your paperwork is in order, your main documents, your birth certificates, your passports, your uh, your car titles, your house stuff, your social security cards, your YubiKey your recovery codes for your for your password manager and your and your Dropbox and whatever your Google account, all the stuff that you need to get back in. If you if your phone gets destroyed um, are all in your fire safe, which is probably going to come with you. Um, yes. 
I don't have. I still don't have a fire safe. I, you should get a fire safe. I've been looking at them since the last time we talked about them, which was God was that last fall. Maybe. I feel like we talked about it a few weeks ago. Maybe uh, they're all sold out. Like anyway. everything else, they're all sold out now. Like the the you yeah, know, prices prices are jacked up on Amazon. They're not uh, easy to come by. <sighs> um, I I'm I I'm. I mean, part of, just to be clear, part of this is I'm doing this so that we can talk through it and I don't forget anything. <laughs> sure. Um, but but yeah, I think like I'm trying to like marriage certificates um, and then also like I have in, in there like stuff of real sentimental value, like, you know, a drawing that my daughter did for me in kindergarten that I love and and um a thing that my grandmother, uh, that my mom got me from my grandmother's house when she passed and, and stuff like that. Sure. So gosh, I mean, if you're starting to incorporate sentimental objects, this could get tough for me because they're kind of spread all over the house. Like they're not, they're, well, certainly, that, I mean, they're not categorized yeah. in a way that I could grab them all and just run. Well, so that's like, that's part of the process, right? Is you walk around. Well, first off, one of the other things you're, I think you're supposed to do is walk around and shoot video of all of the objects of value in the home. Huh, interesting. So that you can, when the insurance situation arises, you can say, look, here's, here's a record of all the things that are in here. Here's our Lego collection. It comprised 40 kits that have these, you know, blah, 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 this much value. Write me a check, please. Um, yeah, the but on the documents front, I think so my strategy on the documents front was to go through and think, OK, what do I need to get a new passport? What do I need to get a new driver's license? What do I need to replace titles or whatever on cars that are destroyed potentially? Um, what do I need to recover digital access to anything that is gone on the computer? Is the is there an offsite backup of the computer? I I fired up Backblaze last night just to make sure it was up to date. And it is. Um, do I put the NAS drive, like the NAS backup drive, I think is maybe going to go in the, in the fire safe too. Okay. Because, you know, or maybe I'll just pull the drives from the NAS. I haven't decided yet. I I'm that I'm still working through. What form is your external backup? It's a one, one just giant 10 terabyte drive. One drive. That's it. I would yeah. just, is if that has everything on it from the NAS, I, that's what I would do. Like well, I, have, it doesn't have movie collection. It has all the oh. documents and photos and stuff. Okay, I've got. So uh, like, uh, yeah. okay. go ahead. I might, I might just pull. I have the other option is to pull four, eight or ten terabyte drives, whatever I have in there now, and and just then rebuild the free NAS machine when the time comes. Sure, that that would totally work. I've got, uh, I've got two ten terabyte USB externals. Because I did put my movie collection in to the backup. It's my, yeah. that backup is my entire NAS. But uh, I would I would grab those. I would leave the NAS because it's a full size, you know, oh, ATX. Yeah, not bringing the machine for sure. Uh, I don't know if just pulling those things without like uh, what's the what is the ZFS term exporting the pool, whatever you, the, you can whatever the like formal disconnection process is. I don't know if I don't know if just like. If we're talking like you literally have 30 minutes to get the fuck out, uh, I, I don't I don't know if like just yanking the drives from the connection is safe or not. Or if, if would... you turn off the computer, you can just grab them. OK, I, yeah, that's, I, you're right. Yeah. You're right. That, and that's pretty fast. That takes 90 yeah. seconds to just hit, yeah. hit shut down and wait. I mean, even if you have to pull the power plug and just grab the ca yank the cables, yeah. you're still probably fine. I guess if you're <laughs> if you're <laughs> if you're in a situation where you don't have time to shut down a computer. You're probably yeah, not. You're probably don't not worry about the data. You're probably not thinking about the NAS backup to begin with. Yeah, worry. Let your offsite backup do be your be your guide in yeah. that case. Do you have Do you have an offsite? Uh, so all of our photos and home videos and stuff are on Google Photos. Okay, that's what I. That's basically the type of stuff I need to back up is old home movies and and stuff like that and and yeah, some old like digital apocrypha and, and miscellany. I'm trying to think. There's there's a public. Like there's a, the public folder on the NAS is like our dumping ground for shit like documents that are going back and forth between Gina and me and stuff like that. So I need to look at that and make sure that there's because that that isn't probably on the it, that's not cloud backup backed up, but I could put it in a folder that backblaze covers like I could mirror it to a folder that backblaze blaze covers on my PC. Sure. And and that would solve that problem, would which you, I might do. <clears throat> would you trust a somewhat more kind of consumer service like Dropbox for stuff like that? Or is that too open? Yeah, for absolutely. OK, 
I mean, so the problem with Dropbox is if you have two factor on and you lose your phone, how do you recover oh, sure, it if you sure. don't have those codes, yeah. which are probably stored in Dropbox? Because that's where I, most people put all the like my recovery codes are in a, a, um, a Veracrypt AES file on Dropbox that I remember the password to. Sure. So I had to print out the Dropbox codes. And the one password recovery codes and put them in, you know, they're in the fire safe now. So that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I've been, I've been meaning to set up something like an Azure blob storage volume for quite a long time, like in a yeah. cold, cold storage kind of way. Cause that stuff, uh, did we talk about that? Yeah. Recently? We talked about it a couple weeks ago. It's really, I went and looked at the pricing. It's ridiculous. It's basically nothing. Once yeah. You it's transfer like in for, for hundreds of gigabytes. Uh, yeah. it's like, I, I didn't do the math. I'm, this is super fuzzy, but isn't it like a dollar or two a month to hold, to store like, Maybe it even, was less, maybe maybe even terabytes. Does it go I assume that they're I assume they're storing that stuff on like people's Slack Xbox Drive space or something. <laughs> it was so cheap. <laughs> it's entirely possible, but um, and again, yeah, I think we talked about it before. But again, that's like that's the kind of storage that you expect not to have to access, right? Like if you if you do need to retrieve data from it, you are going to pay a substantial amount of money. It's it's worth paying the money to access right. if it's like, you if you have to access that data. If yes. you need to get data out of it, you're gonna be you're gonna be happy to pay the couple hundred bucks it's gonna take to get it. Or well, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm spitballing well, that number. It's it's gonna be a lot, but like if you're in the situation where you need to access it, you will be happy that you can access it at all, and you will gladly pay the money. But otherwise, otherwise, that's a place to dump super valuable sentimental data and expect to not touch it unless disaster strikes. Well, and and I mean, in a lot of ways. The Google Photos, I think I pay for as part of a Google One subscription. I can't remember if I have to pay for that separately, but basically I have multiple terabytes of space available for photos and video. Yeah. And and it serves the same purpose purpose and it's searchable, which is really nice. Right. So you, you can search by the content of the photos because, right. you know, machine learning. <clears throat> even if you're uh, even if you're willing to juggle free accounts, there's like there's Dropbox, there's OneDrive, there's Google Drive. Like there are enough free services out there that you could spread stuff like that out across them and kind of have some redundancy. But then you get into then you get into a situation of like if you two factor all those services, where do you keep those codes and you still have to have a way to get into that stuff? Well, and and also like having having done the thing where I have a backup, all the backups on hard drives in the garage and I'm like, shit, which hard drive is this one on? It's is it this one or is it this one or is it this one? Like if you're in a disaster, you don't want to have like just it's, yes. you know find pay for something. I mean, yeah. Backblaze isn't even very. It's like less than ten bucks a month, I think, for the for the basic thing. They're not paying us; just they're they're the ones doing that that I've used in the past and and liked. Um, okay, so documents in the fire safe. Can you think of anything I'm not like that should go in the fire safe that we're not thinking about? I mean, how big a fire? We're we talking like the sort of briefcase, like little tiny suitcase size fire safe, not like a floor like a, a standing floor safe right so so the one is the one i have is like a it's like the size of a sm- mid-sized cooler it's like maybe okay. a foot and a half of normal with file hanging file cabinet okay so you can put your hanging files in there and oh, there's room in the bottom for some shit that goes underneath the bottom a, of the files that's a decent size you could get some stuff in there the one i was looking at was like like a briefcase size like you wouldn't put much more than like documents and some usb sticks in there probably yeah well, this one I bought because I had all this, I had all the paperwork for my business. And I was like, if I lose this, like if something happens to the house and this is gone, then I'm, I have a hard time. Like yeah, you, be, you've, you've got way more yeah. considerations around that. So you, you run a business, you're married, you have a child, you own a house. Like I don't, I, I've, that's true. I, I live a bit <laughs> all more great off the grid than you. Let me tell you. And Brad's Shut ready to grow a beard and move to Montana. I am working on it. It's getting there. Montana's nice, it seems. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe Montana. I maybe I get, buy a missile silo you know, in Montana I don't, I don't, and just move I, in. I don't hear a lot about disasters in Montana, it turns out. Yeah, well, that's because they don't let anybody leave the state. Anyway. Um, what do you think, okay, what do you think so, the internet connections are like there? Uh, it depends on the municipality and whether they did municipal fiber or not. I'm going to guess no. If you yeah. live in a community in Montana with municipal fiber, please let us know. Yeah. And and hey, if you like it, even actually, if you live any place in the northeast or northwest that's not on the coast and in the fire zone, holler. Any place, We'd love to hear about your places. places. Well, you know, Mid- Midwest has its own problems. Ask ask Iowans right now. How, I'm not interested in tornadoes or how, di- di- I don't even know how you say it. Derecho? To, yes. Yeah. That stuff. I, I, that sounded bad. We, we know we know someone in Iowa who is having a rough time of it. And that sucks a lot. Like. Well, I mean, the thing and the thing is, it's funny, Bruce Sterling wrote books about this. There was a book called Heavy Weather that he wrote in like 2002 that basically was like, 
hey, here's what's going to happen in the flat middle parts of the country if if climate change is real, when climate change is real. And it was set in 2050, but we're seeing it now because <laughs> the tornadoes are bigger and we're getting all these, you know, 100 mile an hour windstorms and all of this stuff. So I'm a little skeptical of any place that's flat. Yeah. Um, at the same time, Southeast hurricane zone. Yeah. Not great. Yeah. Got two hurricanes heading toward the Gulf Coast right now. That's yeah. that's bad. Buckle down and leave if they tell you to, please. Yeah. We were in um, enough that the hurricanes just manifested as like really bad rainstorms. And that was kind of it. Oh, so floods then. Well, well, no, because we were in the mountains, so it couldn't flood. It was actually like. Well, it can flood. It just doesn't often. Pretty resilient area. But uh, uh, how, I don't know if we've talked about this before. How how much do you check yourself when you see what looks like a freak weather occurrence and immediately go to climate change as the explanation? Like, do you do you try to moderate that response or do you just like assume everything is because of that at this point? You know what I mean? So, like, like, do you do you try to mentally draw a line between like. Because, you know, like the, you look back at like the last hundred yeah. years of record keeping or whatever, and you see like even before the industrialization of the world ruined everything, you know, there were freak like temperature spikes or whatever. You know, there were freak yeah, 500 weather, year storms, weather and climate problems in, in the pre-industrial past. Right. So like, do you do you try to do you try to distinguish mentally between like that is definitely climate change? This could just be like a freak, a normal freak. You know what I mean? Is that is that distinction so, even worth making at this point? So. um I'm not an expert on this. My rule is when somebody, when a meteorologist describes something as a 500 year storm, meaning it's the kind of storm we have roughly every 500 years. And we have three of those <laughs> in, in sequential years. Yes. My assumption is that something's up there. That one is, that's a safe assumption. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, and there, and there are, um, there are certain entities out there that I think are considered kind of universal authorities. You yeah, know, like they're like, oh, whatever, I don't want to get into a, a I don't go off on a political tangent here, but there's like a pretty obvious war on expertise over the last few years. Right. Like there's a what? Trem- trem- tremendous amount of undue skepticism around around experts and uh, uh, evidence Brad, evidence su- based fact finding, that sort of thing. You know what I mean? Go on. Are you suggesting that the people <clears throat> who are blaming China for climate change are perhaps doing that without the best of intentions. I'm I, shocked, you know, sir. I'm, shocked. Gonna, I'm just going to, you know, I'll leave that as an exercise for the listener. But what, I, what yeah. I'm getting at is that there are certain institutions, I think, that are that, that withstand that kind of skepticism, such as, let's say, the military or yeah. firefighters, you know, like people who work in really hands on nitty gritty disaster response or heavy logistics type stuff. Yeah. And you will see those institutions very honestly talking about the effects of climate change you know what i mean like uh-huh. like firefighters like they like the, like i the last time the fires were that bad in california like you saw people in that line of work saying like yeah that's exactly what this is because they can't they cannot afford to pussyfoot around and like play with the truth right or like like if, you know if the, they the, do the, then you know massive parts of the state will burn right and people, people will, die. will die like like yeah. like like the military has to be able to deploy insane amounts of manpower and machinery around the globe on a moment's notice right like they cannot they cannot afford <clears throat> excuse me they cannot afford to equivocate about you know yeah they, they can't take the political line that factors, hey, climate yes. change is not real right, i'm, like, a, like, I'm like, a dipshit republican like like factors blah blah, blah. like factors that affect their their ability to do their job you know they're the, the logistical variables they have to be extremely realistic about all of them and like like when i when i see institutions like that talking honestly about where the climate is going awry is i think when i really start to worry or but also that's the kind of thing that at least like most people will recognize as an authoritative assessment there, there's a there's a couple of things to always remember one of them is that we are literally the only developed country in the world where this is a conversation that goes on Right. Like the rest of the world has a, has accepted that man-made climate change is real. Yeah. And there's not a scientific there's I'm air quoting scientific again. There's not a scientific debate about whether this is a real thing. Right. So sometimes taking your cues from the rest of the world and assuming that the other, you know, six point seven billion people on the planet maybe know what the fuck's going on is a useful exercise. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, like if the if it's a cold winter. Not climate change. I mean, maybe climate change, but doesn't matter. Yeah. If you have four record fire seasons back to back because of a of a ten year drought that that has barely barely seen a dent in in terms of rainfall, 
probably it's time to think about maybe some shit's going bad with our choices as a species. Yeah, yeah. This is um, definitely the most uplifting episode we've ever recorded. If, 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 hey, look, if you see a few back-to-back record hurricane seasons because the Gulf Stream is slowing down and salinity of the poles are bad because the ice sheet on Greenland's melting and giant chunks of ice are breaking off the Antarctic... I don't know. That seems like maybe that could have uh, climate change impacts there. Who knew? Who knows? Yeah, yeah. If methane in Siberia and the in the tundra is being released in unbelievable quantities because you know the ground is literally on fire because it's thawing for the first time in tens of thousands of years. Safe, uh, safe assumption. I think probably that's bad and <laughs> maybe our fault. Yeah. Like at this point, I'm kind of hoping that we have a giant fucking volcano. That just blats a couple of years worth of ash in the let's air not, to give us a little bit of a pause. Let's not even talk about Yellowstone. Is that Look, what it is? It's Yellowstone, uh, there's right? A, there's Isn't a super volcano the super under volcano? Yellowstone, yes. I've been doing some research on this for <laughs> unrelated things lately. <laughs> Why could that um, be? <laughs> it, I, well, it'll be cool if we get to talk about it. Um, that's, a, that's a weird one. I don't know what this episode's even about at, at this point, but like that's, I feel like that's a weird one that really gets into humans' skewed perception of time because... Yeah, that, that's, I, I, that don't... You don't have to worry about that one. No, We're I know, fine but, on that but, one. But that's that's an interesting one where like I, uh, is it that volcano or is it another super volcano? I think there's one out there that they say like, oh, yeah, we're due like that one is going to erupt like any day but, now. But in but in a geological time scale, any day yeah. now means sometime in the next like 20,000 years or something. I mean, I'm making that number up, but you know what I mean? It's, it's like, like Mount Rainier. Right. Right. Like Mount Rainier geologically do. We didn't know that there was a fault under Seattle until a few years ago. Right. right? When there was a big earthquake and. And there, you know, there's always been earthquakes there, but like they were like, oh, shit, there's a fault here we didn't know about. And by the way, probably Mount Rainier is going to blow up at some point in right. the not too distant future. But geologically, the not too distant future is fine. Right. Right. Or, you know, like uh, which um, God, which uh, which major star in a constellation was, oh, Beetlejuice. was, was uh, Beetle, uh, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, right? Beetlejuice. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Beetlejuice that, that, that they thought might be preparing to go supernova. The bottom half is dimming, the top half less so. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And like that one is, you know, they're saying that thing is due, but like due could be a million years from now, you know? I think it's a, I think the range is a hundred thousand, a few oh, hundred thousand. Oh, is it yeah. that close? We but don't still. have that much time, Brad. Right. Exactly. I mean, whatever. Get it's in your the, bunker. Like it's the same, uh, it's the same psychological effect as when people hear about the, our son's red dwarf phase. Or not Red Dwarf, um, um, Red Giant phase, right? Red Giant, yeah. Uh, we won't, like, we like, won't go super giant. We're not big enough for that. Right, like, but like it will consume the Earth in five billion years or so, right? And like people start to panic when they hear about things like that. And it's like, you know, I think you'll be fine. Yeah, I think if, you'll still, have to worry if humanity about that. makes it five billion years, we've really fucking lucked out but, in yes. some important ways. But but also you as a an individual, probably not a concern. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I don't, look, there's a whole other question. Like if you had the opportunity to upload your consciousness at the end of days to some sort of orbiting, you know, Comptronium facility oh, that just lets you run in simulation for are eternity. We, are we, I feel like this podcast do is, this? podcast is becoming a cliche. Are we going to have to get into theories of mind here where I we'll ask just call if this that's potpourri? Yeah. Is that actually, is that actually you or is that a copy of you? Look, that's a different conversation is for a different the, day. I'm is, just saying, would you take eternal life in the Comptronium the, space cloud? Well, I again, I would just be giving the digital version of me eternal life, right? And the the meat version of me would languish here on Earth. What if, in order to upload the digital version of you, it's a destructive process, and they have to like dismantle your brain one neuron at a time? Oh, I don't know. Oh, that doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> yeah, right. As, as as ways to go, rate that one's pretty what? novel. It's pretty novel. So, um, one of my favorite things in the Stevenson book that came out last year, the 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 one about uh, Dodge in hell is one of the characters realizes he has a terminal illness and he builds an elaborate suicide machine that also preserves his body. So it's perfect for the uploading process. Huh? Like at, at, at the moment of death. Okay. And it's, it's very grim and wonderful in a Neil Stevenson way that I, I fall. It's fall is the name of the book. Okay. Um. Anyway, Okay, so back to the topic. I just, real, I just want to say real quick, if you, if you haven't played Soma, if anybody listening to this has not played Soma. Oh, Jesus. That game that game, that game, game deals with the digital consciousness question better than just about any game I have I, seen. That's I, had, I had to, The monsters were too scary for me. Yeah, well, I had to they, stop they, playing they, that. They added a mode where you can disable that stuff. Oh, really? Uh, oh. I, don't know if, I don't know if it fully disables them or maybe it just makes them harmless. I forget. Or like t- it kind of disables, disables the stealth aspect or something like that. But like they basically added a story mode, like a don't, don't bother me with this stealth crap. Let oh. me just... 
Did you finish it? No, I oh stopped playing because the monsters were fucking Dude, terrifying. You have you have got to go play through that game. Okay, it's okay. so good. Anyway, um, I'm sorry. Okay, so we. I, I feel like do. documents. <laughs> I feel like we're pretty good on documents, right? Yeah. Birth certificates, titles, social security, passports, marriage certificates, um, uh, your your digital backup stuff, your YubiKey, your recovery codes, all that stuff. Um, How would you feel? For, oh, go ahead. Probably for the Apple account too, or sure. your, whatever your phone account is, whether it's Google or Apple. How would you feel about uh, physical tech items that are like not you know not super easy to replace? Like, do you have? You know, I've got a couple boxes of old games from pretty much my entire life, like the ones that I wanted to keep. Like I kind of, I think I kind of, I kind of, yeah. I kind of winnowed my collection of games down to the ones that I truly care about from, you know, basically yeah, yeah. the NES on and those are boxed up. Like, would you something, something I mean, that if is there's room in the car, right? Right. Like that, yeah. that, that for me falls firmly in the like, okay, I have the things that I need to pick up my life. And then I have the things that are important to me from a, like that fits into the category of things that are important to my like spiritual, like, like the important, the mentally important possessions. Right. right. So it's like things for my grandparents and like a copy of a book that I love and pictures from, you know, that are that are not easy to replace of yeah. people who are past or it, probably I should scan all of these when I'm thinking about it, but like right. existed before the digital days or whatever. I guess that's a that's a slippery slope, though, because you could that list could get very long if you kept adding to it. Like, you know, like my, I've got my grandmother's cast iron skillet in the kitchen, you know, like, do I have time to go fish that out? Like, but there's a, there's yeah. a zillion of those things if you if you really let it get to you. Yeah, it's it's um like the grandmother's cast iron skillet is a good one because that's actually a useful go well, bag sure, item. If you end up sure. camping on the side of the road in <laughs> actually, some sort that, of Trump that, Trump tent town, is, uh, you're is, you're. Like the cast iron skillet is a real you can be the breakfast guy. Then. That's actually survival mechanism. Sure. Yeah. Um. So so I guess that's a good uh, let's see medications and toiletries. Yeah. Obviously medications and prescriptions are important, but prescriptions are mostly digital now. So uh, I, I figure at least a few days worth of clothes so mm. you can wash stuff and have time to dry it. Um. I don't I don't kind of beyond that. I don't really know what to grab. Yeah. Right. It's like, does what matter? Like, what do you what do you need? Like, I'm looking around this room here and like. All the I stuff mean, the I pit. all the stuff well, I care about. Yeah. Oh, well, of course, that goes without saying like that. Would yeah. be, that would be tough, actually, for us, because like they have certain material needs that it would be hard to satisfy for more than a few days with the stuff we could carry with us, if that makes sense. Do you have like, like a portable cage for them? Yeah, yeah, totally. We have, you know, like the little crate type thing that we take to the vet and stuff like that. But like yeah. that, that's not a good long term solution. But uh, the bigger thing is like and this is, you know, this varies by animal. But in their case, they need they need hay. They need grass hay all the time. Like it yeah. is a it's what it's, they eat, right? Well, not, not only is it the staple of their diet, but it is literal. Uh, it's the thing that keeps their digestion going like they're they're somewhat, they're somewhat cattle like in that they have to be grazing at all times. OK. Uh, and if they don't get hay for it varies, but like, let's say 24 hours or something. These are uh, guinea pigs. If yes, you are a listener pigs. who does not know about Brad's proclivities. Uh, they're, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> that's not the word I would use, but um, <laughs> I like the piggies. Um, their digestion will shut down if they don't eat grass hay within like a pretty short amount of time, like a day. Uh, they'll go into they go into something called gut stasis, which is very hard to reverse and is very quickly fatal. So Ugh. like what I'm what I'm getting at is that like hay takes up a lot of space if you've ever been around a farm or had to deal with that kind of thing in bulk, you know, like it's it's a it's a large bulky heavy item, right? And we would carry whatever box we had with us, but in some kind of disaster situation, like that's only going to last so long and then well and the other challenge <laughs> I mean the other challenge is that like a lot of times if you have to go to a shelter or something, there's no they don't allow pets. Right. So, I mean, this was always the problem we had with when Chloe was around was if we had to evacuate because of an earthquake or, or fire or whatever, we just assumed we would be backyard camping. Right. For the, for the duration. But in a fire situation, that's not an option. Yeah. Um, one of the things I did order for the, for the go bag that I didn't have before is I ordered a couple of fire blankets, the survival ones that are both like for for putting out fires in your kitchen or whatever without there it's like a fiberglass blanket that's heavily insulated and you can use to smother a fire but if you're in a in a in a wildfire situation you can also 
like often they'll pass over you so quickly that like you're you're fine if you can maintain oxygen and not burn. So if you, you know, wrap up in that thing on the ground um, and get low someplace that stuff won't fall on you, you can you can survive a lot in those, under those apparently. Yeah. I was looking at, um, I was looking at photos of big basin state park this morning, yeah. which are heartbreaking because the facilities are literally gone. Like they just visitor center and all that stuff has basically been wiped off the earth except for the chimney. There um, were pictures of the, cl- of the trees that were glowing red, right. But where the, where the outside of the trees had burned. Right. But in some of those photos, you will see spots where the land or the ground looks almost untouched, you know, like, I guess it really is just a matter of like what is there and flammable, right? Like if you can, I guess if you can, if you can find an open spot with nothing around you that will burn, then. Yeah. It, it'll what, it'll zip right over you quickly. You just right. have to survive the heat wave. Right. Um, we have a friend, <laughs> we have a friend, topic. I know this is really, really upbeat. We have a friend who hid in his pool under wow. one of those, um, one of those blankets for like four hours in the Santa Rosa fires four or five, three, four years ago. Um, but yeah, anyway, something, um, something I just thought of, I don't know if you want to get into it too much and this is, you know, so somewhat unique to the geography of this area, but you were talking about like, the direction you would have to evacuate because we're, you know, mm-hmm. parts, parts of our area are surrounded on uh, multiple sides by water. And one of the two land directions you have to work with is where the fires are. Yeah. So like, like the, the logistics kind of the traffic logistics of funneling a large number of people through a small number of bottlenecks. Like, I wonder how that would play out. I, I mean, so having talked to people who survived Katrina and the evacuation of Katrina to Houston and, and points North of, of loss of new Orleans when Katrina hit, um, as well as like the stuff that happened in the campfire last year in, in California, like the campfire was so dangerous and, and deadly because, be, because there was only one road in and out of that town. And, um, I mean, in Pacific, we're in a similar situation. We have two, but if one is cut off because of either earthquake shutting the tunnel or a uh, fire on one direction or the other, then, then like we're in a, we're in a not great bottleneck situation. So I think your key is to like, one of the, it's funny. One of the things that, that the coronavirus has, has taught us as a, as a, as a family is that we should trust our instincts when we are worried about something and it like it seems like it's going to be bad you know the downside of overreacting is really low and yes. the downside of underreacting is very high yes so we're going to err on the side of overreacting and if we look like dumbasses that's fine that's a good way to put it i never really thought about it that way cuz yeah like like one is shame and embarrassment and the other is real bad yeah so yeah hmm. Anyway, um, <laughs> flight sim's real good, Brad. Yeah, everybody I'm should sure. take a look. If you have a computer, they'll run that thing. It's worth the 15 hours it took to download. Yeah, I, I want to check it out eventually. I, I need better hardware. I've got, uh, I don't know if this is the time to get into it. I've got potentially a couple of new monitors on the way Ooh, that are boy. a nice, nice substantial upgrade. And then there's maybe what kind of what kind of what kind of refresh rate are you looking at? 100 and f- actually. Can you overclock it? You got the overclock? I can. So you can go up to I don't 165 think I'm or 200. Going to, but oh, let man. me. You should, you should crank those things up. See what uh, 200 hertz looks like. Oh, it doesn't go that high, but it oh. is. Do you remember when we like one of the first episodes of this podcast when I got into how I was going through press releases of LCD panel manufacturers? Oh, I'm aware. Uh, and AU Op- Optronics had uh, announced a very appealing looking line of low of low latency, high refresh IPSs. Yep, they're out. They're finally out. This is one of those. Is it a uh, G-Sync or a FreeSync? It is a FreeSync, but branded G-Sync compatible. Okay, so, so it's one of the ones. Okay, so it'll do enough. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, let's see here. I believe this is what I've been waiting for too. For the record, I believe stock 165 hertz. Okay, that's uh, really good. It will do 170 hertz, which they consider overclocking. Which I don't know if I'm going to get into. I don't I'm know fine. I'm fine. Uh, I'm, five hertz. Right. I'm I'm fine at 144, honestly. I mean, honestly, you're probably gonna end up running everything at 120 because of really? because if you're streaming. Yeah. Hmm. Because Wait, the, is, that, is that really? So I this this cheap monitor is 144 hertz that I bought a few months ago. Like it's too small for what I need, so that's why I'm getting bigger ones. But it is 144, so I've been working with that. But is is it a bad idea to run at that rate and stream? 
And so my understanding is if you are actually running at the full speed, this is from talking to streamers who are fairly prominent and and play games that run at 140, you know, faster than 120 hertz. Um, my understanding is that if you are running at faster than 120 hertz and you have VSync off, which you have to to get the adaptive refresh rate stuff working right, you'll see tearing because if you if if you're doing a two PC stream setup, if you're doing oh, one well, PC with OBS, it's fine. That's what OBS doing. knows to grab full frames. Yeah. Um, when you're doing the two PC stream setup and you're basically duplicating one monitor and piping that out to to OBS on the other computer, this the capture cards usually run only at 60 hertz. So if you're doing two PC, you'll get tearing. Interesting, because it'll only it, it it needs to be a even common denominator like a, it needs to have a shared common denominator sure. that gets to 60 hertz that makes sense yeah i'm, I'm just so on 180 one, or 120 yeah are, I'm, the, I'm, are the numbers you know I'm, I'm just doing software capture with obs i do get some weird stuttering in certain games though and i wonder if that's related but that's a topic for another day i suppose anyway yeah, that's a uh, i get these new monitors and hopefully some hardware upgrades because my pc is aging a bit in that department but uh once i can jack flight sim all the way up i might have to take a look at that thing uh, it's I, I got out the hotess, the hot ass. Really? It's good. Yeah, I flew. I, I fired it up the other day at the end of a stream thinking I was going to like see if I could take off the airplane and I crashed a couple of times and then uh, I ended up flying from San Francisco SFO <clears throat> almost to Portland, I guess, yeah. in a two in like a two engine beach, like little six passenger uh, uh, private plane. Was it pleasant? It was, was it was it just was it nice? So I did the first like probably 40 minutes like you like you're supposed to at like 12,000 feet. And then I did the last 40 minutes like a drug runner flying up the coast. <laughs> okay, so I was like both. cliffs on the right below the below the radar horizon, like 100 feet off the waves. It was awesome. It was both, so like both flying Fal- up, Fal- yeah, flying up Fal- past Eureka and Gold Beach and Crescent City and all that stuff and like avoiding fog banks. And it was it, it is like I don't think I'm going to get like yoke like i don't think i'm gonna go buy a yoke i mean i don't know i'm not gonna rule anything out at this point but like it is fucking cool yeah and it, and, and it's like a return to my first video game sure right flight sim 3 was the first pc game i probably ever played wow. so yeah it's weird. Last, thing, last thing i'll say about it before we go i mean my, my favorite thing about that game so far not having played it is um there's kind of a genre of tweet emerging about it oh uh, the janky the janky data Yes, the, the janky because because they used uh, you know they're using a massive data set to uh, to render the world and a lot of that I think was AI or machine learning driven. Yeah. So this genre of tweet is people finding weird idiosyncrasies that were dynamically generated by the machine learning they used to create this depiction did, of the Earth. Did you know that the world's tallest building is in Melbourne? I guess I yeah. thought it was in Dubai, but so, here we are. <laughs> so did you see the explanation that came out for that? It's typo, right? Yes. So people, if people haven't seen it, there is in the game is it's like a suburb of Melbourne, right? It's like a very, yeah. Like, with, from the looks of from the looks of the the ground, it's like we're talking like two story houses at most, right? Like and, the, and like this looks like maybe an office, like a like a small commercial office building right. or something. This, this is this is one of those very plain boxy skyscrapers that's just all glass on four sides, you know, like nothing out of the ordinary, except for the fact that it is emerging thousands of feet into the air. Probably like it's it is, 212 stories or something, I it think, is, is what is it comes up. The tallest building ever seen on Earth in the middle of this suburb. So, yeah, like somebody, yeah, somebody tracked it down. And I don't know what um, I don't know what public data they were pulling from, what mapping data they were pulling from. But so they're somebody, pulling from Bing mapping data. Is is my Bing? OK, yeah. So so they traced it back. <laughs> somebody who had manually gone in and entered information about that building. Yeah. Had made a typo. And what was it? Just the number of floors that they had specified wrong. I think they put the wrong number of floors in. Yeah. Uh, the funny the funny part is people realize like that the typo had been corrected long ago. But Microsoft, oh, that's funny. Microsoft must have taken a snapshot of that data before somebody noticed the typo and fixed it. So oh, that's the, really funny. So the building that got generated based on their bad data, based on somebody fumbling their keyboard, <laughs> created this like monstrous outlandish skyscraper. I think it's amazing. Well, so the fun thing about uh, the fun thing about the way those. So the first thing I did, of course, is like fired up and fly over the house. And then I went to like my parents house where I grew up. And and it's funny because like when I don't know if you remember when Google started doing the 3D maps, you could go to Google Warehouse and like 
build you could you could do the photogrammetry edges yourself huh. right before they taught the machines how to do that like people would load it up and they would do their houses and that you like you they'd show you the satellite imagery from all the different angles and you'd basically draw lines on the corners and roof lines and stuff like that huh. and then it would make a 3d model out of that sure and uh at some point i guess they collected enough data to just like let the machines do it but the weird thing is it still does stuff like it'll map it it has like a bunch of different common roof types and it'll map what it thinks is the right roof onto the roofs that it sees in the in the satellite photography but it often gets it hilariously wrong in the best possible way so like you'll see you'll see a house that like you know absolutely does not have weird gables and and like um uh, dormers and all that stuff up on, on a roof and then you zoom in on it on the on the plane you buzz it on the plane you're like oh that's yeah the computer got that one wrong <laughs> yes this is this is an example of the good type of future to me this is yeah, this, this is, is this is this is, this is, the this is a, I crave this is a harmless manifestation of weird future tech not the not the much more harmful uh. variants that are out there uh the last one i'll mention that i saw was uh somebody posted a bunch of photos up close of some spots in southern california around la yeah. And said that apparently the terrain generating algorithm has no idea what to do with palm trees. Oh, oh, yeah, I can see that. And instead of palm trees, it just inserted these like ghastly, like jagged looking obelisks poking oh, out of the earth, like literally just these like like onyx uh, like teeth, just gross looking like black sharp rocks sticking out of them, like lined all down like freaking you know, Santa Monica, Santa you, Monica Boulevard sure? or whatever. Are you sure that's not um, like a long now monument that shows you which way to avoid the the nuclear? That's an episode we have to do. Yeah. Is like, how do you make a monument that survives the English language that tells people to stay away from the nuclear waste dump? I love that stuff. Like, yeah, kind of universal, universal pictogram type stuff. Yeah, exactly. How 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 will future people that are completely disconnected from our civilization? Esperanto. Mentally process information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on the subject of the evacuation stuff, if people, I know that we have people in the audience who've had to evacuate because of hurricanes or fires or whatever in the past. Uh, if you have suggestions, things that we've not thought about, uh, obviously like stuff like tents and sleeping bags seem like they would make sense depending on the, the individual situations. Um, but yeah, holler and, and send an email to techpod at content.town. If you have, if we missed stuff and we will, we will add them back. Probably next week is the is the uh, is the reader mail oh, yeah. episode. Yes, it totally so is. that would be a great great kickoff, a great uplifting kickoff for next week. But I think like like the disaster preparedness episode, this stuff is easier if you think about it in advance than yes. when you need it. Nobody and wants to think about it until they have to, but it's a good idea. Yeah, like I think we're going to make a list so that if we have. If we find out we have six hours, then we can actually take advantage of the six hours and get that's, out on the early side of six hours rather than waiting to the last minute. Yeah, that's that's smart. I think it's I feel like it's it's really a, a sign of the times. You 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 guys are one of three families that we know that all spread out in very different parts of, of this area who are all yeah. on on the. Like, we, just to we be clear, to, we're not we're not in immediate. We're not in any kind of immediate. Like we have it very easy compared to everybody else. But but like starting to think about that stuff yes. is not ideal one of our friends sent us a photo they took out their front door and you can see the fire off a mile are, or two yeah, like, no, literally, you can literally see oh. the flames on the horizon we're yeah. nowhere near that so now which is good yeah, but um it's an interesting time <laughs> always i hate fire season yeah the thing the thing i realized that we need to do we need a what happens when we get a thousand patrons goal brad Part, party hats Party hats for everybody, all Noise, thousand people. Noisemakers, yeah. Let's just ship them out. Let's let's see if see if we can do it a thousand person jitsy call. Just get everybody in there to put on their party hats and make oh noise God. at the same time. That actually sounds really good. I was thinking we should do a book club episode. Ooh, yeah, we've yes, we talked about that a little bit. Um, I learned once upon a time during a failed cold cold open a few weeks ago uh, <laughs> that you have never read hitchhiker's guide yeah, to the galaxy it is true which it was shameful i one of my dad's friends one of my parents friends gave me a copy of that book when i was probably 12 years old yeah that seems like the right age it was exactly the like it was a formative book for yeah. me it shaped yeah. my opinion of journalism and politics and technology and all this other stuff douglas adams absolute genius 
Um, I'm really interested to see how that book lands to somebody who is not 12 years old. Yeah, I am also curious about that because I have had similar experiences with uh, other kind of like revered childhood sorts of properties yeah. uh, that didn't land especially well. Like this is, I'm, this is not in any way comparable, I don't think. But the Goonies, for example. So I saw Goonies a couple uh, weeks ago for the first time. Really? Yeah. No kidding. I, it, I didn't. It I saw it in my good. 20s. Yeah, it was OK. Like I, I it, it probably landed for me because I have a kid that's in the age for that. And I'm like, that makes you more able to yes, see stuff can, through their eyes. You can you can live a bit vicariously there. But yeah. uh, also not to say that Goonies is on the same level of kind of sociopolitical relevance as uh, as Hitchhiker's Guide. I um no, not in terms of sociopolitical relevance, but in terms of like, I mean, yeah, be, being a formative piece of media, you know, like something that people look back on very fondly. Yeah, I think it's, that's it's, true. It's similar in that respect, but uh, um, yeah, I, I I should read that book. So we're at nine hundred and fifty six patrons okay. right now. Patrons right now. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and I think when we hit a thousand, we should do a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy book club. OK. Yeah. Um episode where we because i haven't read the book in probably 10 years okay we're approaching the time that i'm going to introduce my daughter to it when she's a couple of years older and uh, i'm curious what your takeaway is i've so, got a copy i i years ago this came out i mentioned yeah. it to somebody and they bought me um shocking they bought me i mean there were what five in total four something like five that, that total did. they bought so me he wrote they bought me a single wrote, oh go ahead he wrote four he wrote one do you know the story of this? Actually, it's a fantastic. Really. So, well, maybe we should should we we should save that for the episode. I I, I want to give just the barest hint of teaser because it's right. fabulous. Sorry, I know we're running late. Neil Gaiman wrote a book about this called "Don't Panic" like twenty five years ago before he was famous for being Neil Gaiman. Uh, when he was a teenager, he basically called Douglas Adams and was like, or sent him an email or a post letter or something. It was like, hey, I would like to write a book about the making of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And the upshot is it was originally a BBC radio drama, huh. radio play. And because Douglas Adams is one of was one of the world's great procrastinators, the episodes were literally being written while they were being recorded. <laughs> so like he would be writing the end of an episode while they were in the other room performing it. Man. And as a result, there are I think there's so there's a BBC radio drama. There's the book. There's a novelization. There was a TV show in the 80s. There's the movie now. And then there was a dramatized cast recording that was separate from the radio drama. That was like an audiobook version, but an acted audiobook version of the of the books. So there's like five canonically true and completely huh. different okay. versions of Hitchhiker's Guide. And and it's just it, it is like it was adjacent to Monty Python at the time. Sure. Um, it was adjacent to Doctor Who in, in the 70s. Doctor Who. It's 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 a I, I love it. I'm a I'm a huge fan. I, I, I assume a huge fan. The, the, the novel is the version of record, though, right? I, you know, Even if it what I would first. recommend if you are new to Hitchhiker's Guide, I would recommend you read the novel first. And then I would say, if you're still curious, burn an audible credit on the first radio series. Okay. And uh, and the because the first radio series is really, really good. Like all the radio series are really, really good. But but the first one is is, is especially notable. Yeah. But he wrote what? Four follow ups. Is that right? So there's yeah, the, it's uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the restaurant, at the end of the universe, life, of the universe and everything. Uh, so long and thanks for all the fish and mostly harmless. OK. And then there's this fifth. There's a sixth partially completed thing that he died while he was writing called the Salmon of Doubt. Um, OK. That is the, that's fine. The reason I bring it up is that uh, when when it, it came out a number of years ago that I had never read it to someone I know and they went and bought me the like omnibus, the, the, the single volume collected works kind of version. And that thing yeah. is like the size of a phone book. Which which led me to think that it would be a massive undertaking to read, but I guess the for it's the actual the, the book is probably not that long, right? The, the actual books are like 300, 250, okay. 300 pages. Probably okay. they're not they're not they're they're good and they're fast because they're 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 very funny. Like he was a very funny man. Yeah. Um, I think and I they're can, I can budget time for that. They're probably more relevant now in the world of smartphones and technical dystopia than they were in the 80s when most people didn't know what a computer was that, that is that's actually quite uh intriguing to hear yeah i it, so it, here, let me just ask it, it does does knowing through osmosis about 42 no def, it's not def, gonna make any difference. affect anything at all okay 
Look, there's a there's a thing in Mostly Harmless that I save and have quoted that basically the basic gist, I'm going to fuck up the quote, so I apologize in advance. But the basic gist is that the only difference between a thing that cannot fail and that is that that might fail is that the thing that cannot fail is the people who designed the thing that cannot fail did not include any thought into what would happen when it fails. So like they had they because of this, after some robot uprising or something, they had to put a, a rule on every machine that says this this device might may fail. And here's what happened. You know, <laughs> huh. it's it's like he saw the dystopia coming. Yeah, he may have gotten bits of it wrong. Sure. But like in the in the way that Neuromancer doesn't feels weird when you read it now because it doesn't include any talk of cell phones. Like this does not because the fucking thing that they use is basically an eye like the iPhone is the hitchhikers. Anyway, no. you should read these books. They're I good. will read. I'll just read it. the first one. I'll do it. Um, thank you, as always, to all of our patrons. Yes, uh, absolutely. Very special thanks to the executive producer level patrons, Andrew Cotton, uh, David Allen and Jacob Chapel. And uh, thank you all for listening. If you if you if you support the show through the Patreon, that's great. If you support the show by tweeting about it, we've gotten a lot of really good tweets the last couple of weeks about things that people liked and we're yeah. sharing with their friends. Yeah. I love seeing those. Yes. It's, it's really, really lovely to, yes. to see people telling their friends about our goofy podcast. Yes, it's incredibly gratifying. Um, and and how many pa- patrons do you think we have right now? I hadn't looked in a, in a day or in a week or a month. I'm not sure. I thought 956 eight. now. That's a good number. So we're 44 away. I maybe should have shot higher with the number of patrons. You mean we're not we're not quite 42 away. God damn it. Just yet. Okay, we have to stop. See y'all next week.